Rosa. Today our seminar speaker, and actually it's our first seminar speaker for the, this academic year. And, and Paul told me to remind everybody that all other speakers will be at 2 p.m. because we initially were planning the you know, in-person seminars, but because we're switching to Zoom again, then we'll switch them back to 2 p.m. So other than today. Um, so Andrew, I actually really wanted to meet him. I actually kind of regret that we're doing it by Zoom because I never met Andrew before. And, but I'm uh, really impressed by his work and know him from the papers and basically actually really wanted to see him in person. But um, so he is, um, he has actually pretty spectacular career. Actually, if you look at his CV, it's kind of amazing. Um, so he was um, undergraduate in the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and he graduated with, um, you know, high honors in biochemistry, chemistry, mathematics. And actually, he told me that he already as an undergraduate student, he did quite a bit of research um, and actually published papers as an undergraduate student in, in protein crystallography and actually learned protein crystallography as an undergrad. And then from there, he went to uh, Stanford University. Um, uh, to graduate school, and he did PhD in structural biology with Brian Kabilka. Um, it's actually the same department I did my postdoc, but in a very different time, much later. So uh, Brian, of course, we all know, um, you know, got Nobel Prize for the uh, studies of G GPCR receptors, and that's what um, Andrews actually was doing in his lab is to do structural biology of GPCR and sort of study GPCR signaling. And um, actually was one of the people who set up sort of structural biology in Brian's lab. Uh, and he was so successful as a graduate student that he actually didn't do postdoc. He actually went directly from um, after graduation of um, um, his, getting his PhD degree from Stanford in 2014, he went directly to become a faculty member in Harvard. And you know, I was kind of amazed to see that because I know sometimes it happened, used to happen before, but this is like the um, very, very rare when somebody was so successful as a graduate student that he was able to immediately go and get a faculty position. And, and he was actually very successful as a faculty. So he very quickly, he went from, uh, in a few years, he basically already became uh, six years after starting his lab, he became a full professor at Harvard. And, um, and all of that is basically because his spectacular um, research success in, in several fields. And, and, and his sort of research interests revolve around studying of um, basically signaling by transmembrane proteins. And uh, his interest is, remains to be with the GPCR receptors. And I think today he's going to talk a little bit about, uh, he's going to talk about the, some of his work on uh, GPCR receptor signaling. And um, I actually know him from his work on the signal receptors because while he was working on G uh, GPCR, he, uh, he basically got to know about signal receptor fields and he realized that um, there's sort of a lot of unanswered questions on signal receptor. And actually, uh, I, I know him because in 2016, he published first crystal structure of sigma one receptor, which was a very big deal for the field. I mean, the receptor was born in 1993 and like people had a lot of, sort of speculations about what the structure looked like. And um, he actually sold the structure in 2016 and sold it in a little bit uh, cubic phase, uh, lipid cubic phase format. And that was actually very, very important um, uh, advance to the field uh, because it was very controversial what the structure is. And, and he also did another con uh, made another contribution by uh, also uh, um, determining molecular identity of sigma two receptor, which is another sort of um, was mystery in the field about uh, uh, you know, what the sigma-2 receptor is. And there were several candidate proteins. And there was actually been papers published about claiming that they identify sigma-2 receptor. And actually, Andrew um, finally sort of resolved that whole controversy by um, um, showing this, this protein TBM97 as a sigma-2 receptor. So from my perspective, you know, in a sigma receptor field at least, he made two very, very significant major advances. Uh, in his career already. Uh, so in first crystal structure of sigma one receptor and determine the molecular identity of sigma two receptor. And he just told me that he has a paper actually um, in, in revision where he solves also crystal structure of sigma two receptor. So it's a very, very spectacular contribution, but 
Uh, unfortunately, he's not going to talk about Sigma receptors today. I hope he will talk about that today, but he'll talk about GPCRs and, 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 and um, um, technology development. But Paul told me that we have more uh, opening for seminar series. So we probably will ask Andrew to come back again and talk about Sigma receptors, right? <laughs> All right, all yours. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, can you hear me and, and see me and everything? Okay. So yeah, it's really um, a pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for the, the introduction and for the opportunity to tell you about some of our work. Um, you know, as mentioned, I'm not going to talk about Sigma receptors today. We've been doing a lot of work on Sigma receptors, and I think there's some exciting new work there. Um, if you're interested, we have a, a preprint and bioarchive on some of the most recent work um, that we've been doing there, and, and a paper hopefully will be um, published in a journal soon um, on that. But today I'm going to focus on, on some other work that we've been doing. <clears throat> also part of a long-running project where we've been interested in understanding the um, structural and molecular basis for a phenomenon called biased agonism in G-protein-coupled receptor signaling, which is, I think, potentially therapeutically relevant and also really is sort of a mystery from a basic science standpoint as to how these receptors can uh, signal in very different ways in response to ligands, even though they are, you know, just a single um, receptor. And um, a lot of this work really has led to, it has necessitated the development of new tools um, in the form of antibody fragments and antibody fragment discovery methods um, that we've applied to GPCR. And so um, near the end of the talk, I'll show some more recent work we've done um, in a collaborative project with the group at UC Irvine um, using uh, new methods to develop better antibody discovery platforms for in vitro um, antibody discovery. So, um, just to introduce everyone, I think this is probably review for many people, but um, G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs are the single largest family of transmembrane proteins in humans. And um, they're about 800 different um, members. And um, with few exceptions, all of these receptors signal through essentially the same uh, mechanism. They reside in the plasma membrane of the cell. Uh, they bind to an activating ligand, which is called an agonist. And this leads to an allosteric conformational change on the intracellular face of the receptor. Um, that essentially turns it into a guanine nucleotide exchange factor for heterotrimeric G proteins. So it catalyzes exchange of GDP uh, for GTP. That leads to structural rearrangements in the G protein, which then causes it to activate um, downstream effector proteins uh, like adenyl cyclase to elevate cyclic AMP. GPCRs are also regulated by phosphorylation by GPCR kinases or GRKs, um, which leads to recruitment of beta restin, um, which then uh, results in receptor internalization and either degradation or non-canonical signaling um, followed by receptor recycling to the plasma membrane. And so um, what I'm going to focus on today in the GPCR work is, is really this phenomenon called biased agonism um, in which a receptor can preferentially signal either through the G protein pathway or the arrestin pathway. And this preferential signaling is dictated by the structure, the chemical structure of the ligand that's bound to the receptor. So I'm going to focus everything today on the angiotensin II type 1 receptor, AT1R. Um, this is a, a very important receptor, both biologically and as a model system for GPCR signaling. Um, the angiotensin receptor is uh, a critical regulator of uh, sodium retention and of blood pressure. Um, and as a result of that, it's become a very important drug target. Something like 5% of the adult population in the United States takes drugs targeting this receptor every day. Um, and a similar number of people, maybe even a larger number of people, take drugs targeting uh, this pathway, but a bit upstream of the receptor. So it's an extremely important therapeutic drug target um, for treating blood pressure, but it's also an important uh, model system for understanding this phenomenon of biased agonism. And I'll explain why and why this receptor is, I think, a uniquely um, excellent target for looking at this. So this phenomenon of biased signaling or biased agonism occurs when a receptor um, in response to a certain ligand preferentially signals through one pathway relative to another. So I'm showing data here from uh, Jonathan Violin, uh, who's then at Trevena Pharmaceuticals. And basically what they're doing in this ex experiment is looking at the effect of different ligands through two different assays. They're measuring activation of the beta restin pathway in black and measuring activation of the G protein pathway in red through this IP1 assay. This is a, a GQ um, pathway assay. So for conventional agonist in this receptor, um, the dose response for signaling basically results in a, a normal um, saturable effect. And you can see that this happens for both ligands, for both pathways, sorry, um, with the native hormone angiotensin II. And the curve for beta restin is right shifted by about tenfold. And this is common just because this is a less highly amplified uh, readout. For an antagonist or blocking ligand, nothing happens. You can dose it in, there's no effect on G protein signaling, no effect on arrestin. But then for this beta restin biased agonist, TRV 120027, um, you can see a very strong response to the arrestin pathway, 
about 80 to 90 percent of maximum uh, achievable by angiotensin 2, while there's essentially nothing happening on the G protein pathway. So really this compound, um, which is, uh, you'll see in a moment, structurally very similar to angiotensin 2, uh, has no ability to activate the G protein pathway while it's nearly fully efficacious on the arresting pathway. And the big question is how this um, can occur at a molecular level. Part of the reason we care about this is that not only is it interesting from a basic science standpoint, but it's also potentially therapeutically very important. Um, and so this is data, again, from the same paper from uh, Truvina Pharmaceuticals, where they show that if you dose progressively higher levels of either a conventional antagonist, telmosartan, or of their arrestin-biased drug, um, you see a decrease in blood pressure. These are experiments done in, in mice. And uh, if you do the same um, experiment where you dose these drugs, but instead look at a, a measure of cardiac performance um, called ESPVR, which is a measure of the uh, pressure that the heart can generate at a given volume, um, they see that the two curves diverge, and this TRV compound actually um, results in improved ESPVR as a function of dose, while the conventional antagonist results in a decrease. So this is really exciting because it says that um, potentially you can imagine targeting a GPCR with a biased agonist and achieving a subset of its effects that might be therapeutically desirable while avoiding undesirable side effects. And in the case of the angiotensin receptor, um, one of the reasons that this is a really good model is that the ligands for this receptor that have very strong bias profiles are all structural analogs of each other. They're all derivatives of the native hormone angiotensin II, which is an eight residue peptide. I'm showing the sequence here from N to C. And you can see that um, all of these different ligands here, including these orange compounds that are um, very strongly beta restin biased, um, show the same basic organization. Um, they typically start with either aspartate or uh, methylated glycine, and then have the same sequence except at position eight, which is the major determinant of signaling profile. There's some differences in the middle, but really this position eight is the key determinant of the functional properties of these peptides. And you can see that in the case of angiotensin II, there's phenylalanine in this position. And in general, um, any derivative of this peptide with a relatively large substituent in position eight results in a, a peptide that will signal strongly through the G protein pathway and usually also through the arrestin pathway while smaller substituents result in attenuated G protein signaling while retaining uh, beta restin activation. So isoleucine in this position results in a modest attenuation, um, complete deletion or replacement with alanine or dialanine results in a peptide that is essentially entirely uh, arrestin biased. And the one at the very bottom here, TRBO27, is the one that I showed you in the signaling assays just a moment ago. So small amino acids or deletion in position eight results in selective signaling through the beta restin pathway. So we wanted to know what's going on at a structural level. And um, to do this, we, we turned to a technique that was originally developed um, by my former advisor and his collaborator, Jan Steyr. Um, and so basically the idea is that when a receptor is bound to an activating ligand, it becomes highly dynamic. The uh, receptor visits multiple conformations with uh, transmembrane helix six, existing either in an in inward conformation or in an outward conformation um, or various intermediate states. And so um, to address this and make this receptor tractable for structural study, we use a single domain antibody fragment called a nanobody to trap the receptor in a defined state that we can characterize pharmacologically, we can determine functionally what this state is doing. Um, and then we can also, by, by virtue of having a structurally homogeneous sample, we can characterize it through um, X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, or other methods. So these nanobodies, um, like I said, are single domain antibody fragments, and they're derived from uh, llama, camel, or alpaca antibodies. So conventional antibody um, that goes that you find in, in humans and pretty much all other uh, mammals has two chains, a heavy chain and a light chain. And at the tip of this dimeric structure is a, a VH domain and a VL domain, a variable heavy and a variable light domain. And these collectively uh, determine antigen binding specificity. But in llamas, camels, and alpacas, there's a secondary antibody repertory in addition to conventional antibody repertoire um, that consists only of the heavy chain. They have a deletion of this uh, domain here, the CH1 domain. And this eliminates the light chain entirely and means that the entire antigen binding specificity of this molecule is contained within this single uh, VH domain, which is called VHH in this case, um, and more commonly is called the nanobody. So this can be expressed in isolation as a single 15 kilovolt protein <clears throat> that's structurally rigid and contains the full functional properties of a, a conventional um, antibody fragment. And uh, this nanobody it has its activity determined by three different loops um, called complementarity determining regions or CDRs, um, numbered one, two, and three. 
And CDR3 is generally the major determinant of antigen binding specificity and is the largest and most uh, diverse in terms of sequence. So these nanobodies have been really powerful tools for cell biology um, and for investigating GPCR structure and function. Um, but in the case of AT1R, um, our collaborators in the Lefkowitz lab had been injecting llamas um, with purified angiotensin receptor for over five years um, without obtaining useful binders. Useful in this case, meaning confirmation specific clones that can stabilize this desired active state um, that bias ligands recognize. <clears throat> so we needed to find another approach. And so um, instead, we turned to a, a technique called yeast surface display. It was originally developed by Dane Woodruff and colleagues in the late 1990s um, and has since become a, a really powerful technique for combinatorial biology. And uh, this is a method that allows sampling of very large antibody fragment libraries up to sizes of about 10 to the 10th uh, unique clones per library. Um, one of the really key advantages of this approach compared to techniques like phage display or ribosome display or mRNA display is that yeast display is a cell-based method, which means that we can use uh, fluorescence-activated cell sorting or FACs to specifically isolate cells that express nanobodies with a desired set of functional properties. So we can design complicated selection experiments um, to enrich clones that bind to one conformation but not another, or to select for clones that bind tightly relative to their level of surface expression, um, or that have very high selectivity, or that have cross-reactivity between two targets, essentially any sort of functional property you can imagine um, encoding in a fluorescent signal with a cell, you can sort for it and you can identify clones that possess that property. And finally, just as a practical matter, yeast cells grow relatively quickly. And so we can do these selections um, start to finish in a relatively short period of time. So typically from beginning a selection to identifying clones for characterization, if you do four, four rounds of selection, you can do this in two to three weeks. So the basic idea of this uh, approach is shown here. We start with our library of synthetic nanobodies um, displayed on yeast. And each cell displays about 500,000 molecules of a single nanobody clone on its surface. Each cell displays a different nanobody. Um, and we can incubate these then with a purified target protein or receptor of interest uh, labeled with some sort of detectable marker. Most often, this is either a covalently labeled fluorophore or um, it could be streptavidin, sorry, it could be a biotin, which we can then detect with fluorescent streptavidin, or it could be an epitope tag that we detect with a fluorescent antibody. And then um, we sort those cells that bind from those that don't using either magnetic cell sorting or uh, facts, amplify them, they grow up in culture, and then we can repeat the process as necessary until we have a pool of uh, clones with the desired functional activity. And so in the case of doing this with the GPCR, um, like angiotensin receptor, we have the receptor embedded in a detergent micelle, um, labeled with a fluorophore, either directly or indirectly, and then bound to the nanobody on the cell surface. And so this allows the library to access both the intracellular face of the receptor and the extracellular face of the receptor. So we can make uh, nanobody clones that have very different activities depending on which part of the receptor we're targeting. So we designed a library based on uh, the collection of all nanobody structures that have been published in the PDB. The idea here is that any nanobody that had been crystallized um, probably was biochemically well-behaved, well-folded and stable. Um, and so we use that as the basis for designing our synthetic library and choosing what types of diversity to include in each of the three complementarity determining regions. Um, the sequence composition ends up actually being very similar to that in the immune repertoire. So there's not really a big difference between uh, modeling off of that versus modeling on the PDB. Um, but in any case, we, we use the PDB as the, the basis for our design. And so you can see in, in some of these positions like this position here, um, we allow relatively limited diversity, four different amino acids. Here we allow phenylalanine and serine. And then in these asterisk positions that are highly diverse um, in the uh, immune repertoire and in the PDB, um, we use a mix of different codons. In this case, we used pre-synthesized uh, trimeric nucleotides, trimer phosphoramidites. So essentially we're using a mixture of individual codons that have been pre-synthesized so that we can achieve exactly the uh, composition of amino acids that we want. So 14% tyrosine, 12% glycine, um, 0 percent cysteine, 0 percent methine, and 0 percent stop. So using these pre-made uh, single codons and then mixing them in a defined ratio allows us to achieve this um, type of design. You can see that uh, CDR3 is the most complex with most uh, of these hyperdiversified uh, positions. And then we also introduced length diversity here with this diverse segment varying from uh, 7 to 15 residues in length. So we have three different, different lengths and we overrepresent the 11 uh, residue length because that's closest to the, the mean uh, length that's found in the immune repertoire. 
So in the case of the angiotensin receptor, we designed a selection procedure first to enrich for binders. Um, that's this first part shown in orange in the schematic. Um, but then really the, the key experiment is doing a selection uh, shown here where we take receptor that's labeled with a red fluorophore and bound to an agonist and a separate population of receptor labeled with a blue fluorophore bound to an antagonist. And we can mix all of this together with the cells in a single pot and take advantage of the fact that in this case, we have antagonists with very slow off rate. And so there's minimal exchange of these two ligands on the time scale of the experiment. And that means that we can specifically enrich for those yeast cells whose nanobodies selectively bind the activated conformation of the receptor. And because we have ligands present at high concentration, um, we can direct the selection to the intracellular face of the receptor. So this is a, a really nice way of doing a, a selection where you specifically direct the, the library to give you clones with a very precisely defined functional activity, binding to the intracellular face, recognizing confirmation that's compatible with activating ligand or agonist binding. So um, we ended up doing this. We selected a bunch of clones, screened them, and I'm just going to focus now on, on the one that ended up being the most useful. This is a clone called nanobody AT110. And um, first of all, you can see that this one preferentially recognizes the receptor in an active state or in an agonist bound state. And this is an ELISA uh, type assay looking at either APO receptor binding, antagonist receptor binding, Losartan's a, a classic blocker, um, agonist bound receptor, angiotensin II, the native agonist, or receptor bound to S1I8, which is a synthetic agonist, um, the derivative of angiotensin II that's somewhat higher affinity. So you can see it, it binds preferentially to the receptor when it's incubated in the presence of agonist. And we can also do um, a, a more quantitative experiment looking at a, a radioligand competition binding assay. And in this case, um, we're using a radioactive probe uh, to radiate olmosartan, and we're measuring at increasing concentrations of uh, angiotensin II, um, the displacement of this ligand from the receptor. So in black is the control curve, where you can see that if we add in more and more angiotensin II, we can peed off olmosartan, and this IC50 value gives a, a proxy that we can use to calculate um, the affinity of uh, angiotensin II for this receptor. And since uh, the nanobody stabilizes angiotensin II binding since it's recognizing the active state. Um, we see a left shift in the curve um, when the nanobody is present at a fixed saturating concentration. So this means that the receptor is being stabilized in an active state, in the same state that the native hormone angiotensin II uh, prefers. So unfortunately, this initial clone um, was relatively low affinity. It's about 100 nanomolar affinity. And so um, that was reasonably good, but it's not good enough to obtain a crystal structure. Um, we tried and it didn't work. So uh, instead, we turned to affinity maturation. And in this case, we just used error-prone PCR to mutate this clone um, and diversify its sequence. And you can see here a, a staining experiment with the parent clone, the original uh, isolated uh, nanobody AT110. And then um, in the error-prone library, I should explain, sorry, that uh, angiotensin binding is on the x-axis expressions on the y-axis, and each of these dots in the flow cytometry plot is a single cell, single yeast cell. So um, we see this plot where it goes to the upper right, saying basically that the more uh, nanobodies expressed, the more receptor binding you see. Um, and then in the error-prone library, we see a relative attenuation of this. There's only 4.8% of the cells that are in the, the strong binding gate, um, just reflecting the fact that on average, if you mutate something, you're more likely to make it worse than to make it better. But some of those clones are better, um, even though they're relatively few. And so we can do a fact sort for these cells that are in this uh, far right quadrant. And after enriching uh, several rounds, we obtain a population of binders that are much stronger than the original uh, parent clone. And then we can sequence and identify mutations that are enhancing affinity here. So um, we focused on a number of different positions, but I'm just going to show four that ended up having the biggest effect. Um, these are shown here, position 31, 58, 98, and 113. And in each of these positions, we saw a very strong convergence to either a single substitution or to uh, two different possibilities. So in the case of I98V, for instance, which is the strongest uh, affinity enhancing mutation, um, we find that uh, position 98 uniformly in all of the um, high affinity variants is mutated to V. Um, tyrosine 113 is always mutated to sparagine in all four uh, of the high affinity clones that we found with uh, any substitution in this position. And so um, we took these four uh, hotspot residues that showed very clear preference for alternative amino acids, and we built a consensus clone combining all of them. Um, we also built several other consensus clones with subsets of these, but the consensus with all four of these was ultimately the highest affinity. So we tested it using the same assay I just showed you a moment ago. Um, so we take uh, 
again, a concentration, fixed concentration of a radio labeled probe compound, tritiated olmosartan. And then we compete with an agonist. Um, in this case, we're using a different agonist here, VO55, um, for technical reasons. But basically, you can see that as you dose in higher and higher concentrations of this uh, agonist, you compete off the radioactive probe. That's the curve in black. And if we do the same experiment now in the presence of this non affinity matured clone uh, nanobody AT110 in red, um, we see that the curve shifts a little bit at a low concentration and it shifts a lot at a higher concentration. So at 40 nanomolar, um, the shift is really quite modest, indicating that we're probably well below the KD for this parent nanobody clone. We know now that that's the case. Um, if we look in blue at the affinity matured version, which is AT110I1, um, I1 just meaning improved variant one, um, we can see that at the high concentration, we have an even bigger shift. But even at 40 nanomolar in dotted lines, um, we have a, a very large shift, essentially no reduction in allosteric effect, which is indicating that at 40 nanomolar, we're still comfortably over KD for this nanobody. So now we have something that's significantly improved in affinity. And once we had this molecule and set trays for the first time, we got crystals almost immediately. It was relatively quick to get uh, a structure of this. And we were able to see um, for the first time how the angiotensin receptor recognizes peptide ligands. So I'm showing here essentially a cross-section through the receptor with um, the peptide shown in the active state and then just modeled into the inactive state. This is a previous structure from Ray Stevens' group um, showing what this would look like um, if the peptide were to bind the inactive conformation of the receptor. And you can see that the binding site really constricts quite dramatically uh, in the active state. Um, the receptor almost wraps itself around this peptide, um, really enclosing it entirely. And if we were to look now um, at how these two states would look with a small molecule antagonist bound, you can see that in the inactive state, there's plenty of space, it fits in nicely. But in the active state, this contraction of the binding pocket would be incompatible with this, uh, with this drug. So it would have a clash here at this red arrow. So angiotensin receptor blockers are too bulky to accommodate the constriction, um, which helps to explain how they prevent receptor activation. So they also, of course, prevent ligand binding, they compete with peptides. Um, but they, they prevent receptor activation even at baseline. We were also able to explain the details of how the peptide interacts with the receptor. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except to say that we can um, provide a structural explanation now for some of the mutagenesis data that have been developed for this receptor over, over many decades. Um, in particular, things like lysine 199, which was known to be absolutely essential for peptide recognition. We can see it's making a salt bridge with the peptide C terminus. And so we can provide a molecular explanation for that effect. So really, in general, I would say very close agreement with prior mutagenesis experiments explaining why um, these mutations that affect uh, peptide function have their, their effects. And I'll mention also that the peptide C-terminus uh, sits really deeply buried within the receptor core. So the N-terminus is out here on the extracellular face. C-terminus is buried in the, pep in the uh, receptor uh, binding site. And this is really where the key determinants for receptor signaling properties uh, are going to be situated. So um, we were able to describe the activation mechanism in some detail. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, uh, except to say that we can see how basically a series of conformational rearrangements propagate through the receptor, leading to a very uh, classic um, activated state on the intracellular face with a, a wide open pocket ready to engage the G protein. So as I said earlier, the C-terminal residue in the peptide is really the key determinant of its functional properties. So um, large residues here, like phenylalanine, result in um, ligands that activate the G-protein pathway and the arrestin pathway, while smaller substitutions um, give you peptides that preferentially signal through beta arrestin. And so, of course, once we had this structure with our, our peptide analog S1I8, which is sort of an intermediate ligand um, pharmacologically, it's very high affinity. Um, we were able to dock in uh, phenylalanine in this position to see what would happen. And uh, somewhat surprisingly, we see that you can't actually fit phenylalanine there. It, it clashes with the receptor um, in any of its three rotomers. There's no way you can model this in without uh, forcing a, a change in the receptor conformation. And so we, we thought that this might explain why um, angiotensin II can activate GQ uh, very robustly while none of these other peptides can. So we wanted to look at this in more detail. And so of course, the first question is, does our nanobody bind the receptor when it's occupied with these other compounds, either um, the balanced agonist angiotensin II or these arrestin bias ligands? So again, using this uh, ELISA-type assay, this alpha screen assay, 
we're able to see that there's strong binding um, to angiotensin II occupied receptor, and also reasonably strong binding to receptor bound to TRBO26 and TRBO23. Um, this is also true for TRBO27, although I don't have data here. So our initial structure was with a receptor bound to this S1I8 um, peptide, and we were subsequently able to get structures with uh, three other compounds, native hormone angiotensin II, and then two biased ligands, O26, TRBO26, and TRBO23. And I'll just say that O26 and O23 look almost identical, and so I'm really just going to focus on, on one of these. So first thing you can see superimposing these structures is that at the level of receptor backbone, there's really not much of a difference between these various states. They all look very similar. But if we start looking more closely in the ligand binding pocket, we can see they really do diverge. So here I'm showing the, the two different um, peptides that we're looking at, TRBO26, the biased agonist in blue, and angiotensin II, the balanced agonist in orange. And you can see that this um, balanced agonist here has this lysine 199 interaction. Um, phenylalanine 8 sits here in the base of the binding pocket, while this is essentially an empty cavity in the uh, bias ligand state. At the electron density level, um, we see relatively poor density actually for phenylalanine 8. It seems to be somewhat mobile, um, while the peptide, uh, the entire peptide for TRBO26 is very well ordered. And even more surprisingly, if we look at the residues nearby in the receptor, um, we see that the conformation of this binding pocket is really quite different. So in the uh, angiotensin II bound case, we see leucine 112 is here pointing to the right. It shifts position with the bias agonist. And uh, even uh, weirder is the fact that um, tyrosine 292, um, which is normally very well ordered, very clearly resolved in the biased agonist state, is entirely disordered in the um, balanced agonist conformation. So um, we also looked at this by molecular dynamics simulation in collaboration with Ron Dror, uh, two members of his group. And um, actually, these simulations, first round of these simulations was done before we had a crystal structure. And uh, when they had tried just simulating angiotensin II bound to this receptor, they saw that um, phenylalanine 8 really was visiting multiple conformations. It didn't have a stable state. Um, and actually, this fits really nicely with what we see in the electron density, where um, it's essentially blurred around um, position 8, suggesting it's compatible with this, this model. They also found that um, in their simulations, this phenylalanine 8 would adopt either a horizontal or a vertical rotomer, or this inserted rotomer. And in particular, the horizontal conformation um, was strongly associated with G-protein biased agonists and with a G-protein preferring conformation of the receptor, suggesting that the signaling output for this um, peptide is dependent not only on the identity of the residue here, but also on the conformation of this side chain. So based on that, um, we were able to design a compound um, called 2-aminoindane uh, angiotensin 2. And um, this uh, substituted version has basically a bridging uh, methylene that links the phenyl ring um, to the rest of the, the uh, backbone so that it can no longer rotate. So you're basically forcing it to be in a vertical conformation um, that was more associated with arrest and signaling. And indeed, that's the case. If you test this peptide in a signaling assay, you get relatively little activation of the GQ pathway. It's in orange compared to the control in black. And um, in an arrest assay, we see relatively robust activation, about 50 to 60% of angiotensin II, um, despite not having much activity at all on the G protein pathway. And this is exciting because it's, I think, one of the first, if not the first example of prospectively designing a ligand with the desired biased signaling profile. Um, based purely on structural data. And actually, in this case, this compound um, essentially runs contrary to the, the SAR, the, the structure activity relationship you see just looking at these peptide ligands. So it's actually more bulky in position 8 than angiotensin 2 even, and yet it signals preferentially through the beta resin pathway. So I think it shows that you can use structural data um, to prospectively design molecules with the desired functional property um, in terms of its bias signaling uh, activity. OK, so I'm going to shift gears real quick and just mention um, sort of as a preemptive answer to the question that everyone always asks, which is, you know, if you can make intracellular nanobodies, can you make extracellular nanobodies? And I'll just very briefly say that the answer, of course, is yes. You can make things that bind to the extracellular face of the receptor. And so um, one of these is called nanobody AT118 um, that we developed uh, targeting the angiotensin receptor. This one is a high affinity uh, competitive antagonist of the receptor. So in a competition binding assay, dosing in the nanobody, we can see that it displaces the radioligand probe. Um, the affinity is about 60 nanomolar in this case. Um, and then we can also look at the effect in a signaling assay. Uh, in this case, it's a beta resin recruitment assay. 
and we add in um, the native ligand angiotensin 2, we get a nice signaling response in black. If we do a negative control antibody that binds to the intracellular face, um, this is the same antibody I showed you the structural data for before, it has no effect. But then if we add in this competitive antagonist, AT118, we see a right shift in the curve, and we see also a decrease in baseline signaling, suggesting that it's an inverse agonist um, that's really uh, lowering the basal activity of the receptor. And uh, not only is it active in cells, but we can actually assay this in vivo. Um, this is a collaboration with Howard Rockman and his postdoc, Dao Luang. And so in this experiment, they're taking mice and dosing progressively higher amounts of angiotensin II, measuring blood pressure. So in black is the control curve. Um, as they dose more and more angiotensin II, the mice develop very severe hypertension. But if the mice are pretreated with uh, the drug Losartan, this is a conventional clinically approved angiotensin blocker, um, they see that the effect is blunted. They do the same experiment now with um, our nanobody in red. You see that the curve has shifted to the right. So the nanobody is really preventing this angiotensin II induced hypertension, um, while a negative control nanobody that binds to the intracellular face of the receptor has no effect. So it shows that we can make nanobodies now that target receptors not only from the inside to stabilize defined conformations, but also from the outside to control signaling properties. So I'll just briefly summarize this part and then go on to some newer technology development work that we've been doing. Um, so I showed you that we can use our synthetic nanobody library to rapidly isolate conformation stabilizing nanobodies for GPCRs. Um, when we had these molecules, the crystallography became very straightforward. We were able to get structures of the receptor bound to four different ligands um, in relatively short order. Um, and in the case of angiotensin II, the um, conformation of this phenylalanine 8 really seems to be a key driver of the conformational changes that selectively activate um, G protein signaling over uh, beta restin signaling. And I didn't go into all the details, but um, we also were able to see further changes in the receptor downstream that helped to explain why these differences in the binding pocket itself are coupled to changes on the intracellular face that ultimately um, result in a conformation that's more efficient for coupling to G protein um, or that can only really couple to beta restin. Okay, so with that, I want to shift gears to um, something that's more pure technology development. Um, but before I do that, I just want to set the stage by describing two basic paradigms for antibody uh, and, discovery. Andrew, do you want to take questions on part one now, or you want to wait till the end? Uh, um, I, I can do either, whatever people prefer. So whatever. So if, if somebody wants to uh, somebody wants to ask questions, um, either type it in the chat box, or you can oh, raise. Okay, Alec has a Alec has a question. So just raise the hand and talk like Alec does now. Alec. Alec, Hi, uh, yeah, this is Alec. I, I, I have a question about, you know, the um, active um, structure. So, um, so do you think, you know, the um, nanobody stabilized uh, receptor structure is exactly the same as the uh, native agonist um, bound structure at all? For example, if you have two different nanobodies, do you, do they need to the same uh, structure at all? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's that's kind of the, the standard question, right, is, you know, obviously we're using a tool that has the potential to perturb receptor conformation. And so, um, you know, I would say a, a couple of things. First is that in the case of um, something like the beta-2 receptor, where we have a structure with a nanobody, um, followed later by a structure with the heterotrimeric G protein, they're really very, very similar. They're not exactly identical. There are some subtle ways in which they, they differ, but the vast majority of the structural features are, are essentially the same between the two states. So I think that provides some confidence in this basic approach. But the other thing is that we validate the activities of the nanobodies um, pretty extensively by radio ligand pharmacology. So we know that from the perspective of the ligand itself, in, in terms of the energetics of ligand binding, um, the shifts in uh, ligand affinities are essentially identical between G protein stabilization and nanobody stabilization. So that gives us confidence that we're not stabilizing some sort of artifactual state. It really is uh, very similar to the G protein state. And then finally, of course, you can do mutagenesis experiments and so on to validate. Um, to the question of whether two different nanobodies would induce the same state, um, we, we have multiple nanobodies. They tend to show very similar pharmacological properties. Um, and again, in the case of the beta-2 receptor work from Brian Kavilka's group, um, my, my former advisor has shown that um, multiple structures with the same receptor with different antibodies, again, are very similar, especially in the ligand binding site. As you get closer to the intracellular face of the receptor, there's probably more nanobody influence on the states there. And so um, that's part of the reason I didn't talk so much about that region. 
Um, but one of the things that we can do there is uh, it's possible to run molecular dynamic simulations and remove the nanobody and let the system relax. And I think that provides a better indication of what might be happening there. But really in the longer term, I think we need structures with the native uh, transducer with G protein and with beta restin to be absolutely confident about what's happening in that region. Thank you. Don, Don Hillman. Yeah, uh, just a typical egotistical, egocentric question. So, uh, you know, we uh, have about 10 proteins we would like to be able to inhibit mm -hmm. and we have absolutely no inhibitors for them. A couple, we have, you know, the crystal structures are available and some just speculative structures. So uh, is this the way, to, I, can you tell us, can you tell me this is the way we should go? And uh, we'll, if we start working on nanobodies, maybe we'll have something in one year, two years or 10 years, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak to, to our experience. I mean, it's been, I would say, relatively straightforward for us to make binders for most um, proteins that we've tried. Um, the, the nanobody library itself is available. We, you know, we, we provide it under just like a standard MTA, or um, we have a, a commercial distributor called Carafast, which um, you can just purchase it from them and, and they send it out to you. Um, so, you know, certainly you can get the library, you can run selections and so forth um, yourself, be comfortable doing yeast display. Um, it's not that hard to do, although it does require access to a fax sorting machine to, to really be able to do it effectively. Um, I would say that depending on the protein of interest, the success rate you know, might be higher or lower. It's worked really well for us for GPCRs. In general, nanobodies have a propensity for binding to cavities. So proteins that you know, don't present concave epitopes are probably more challenging. The other trend we've seen um, is that there's a very clear um, difference in performance of the library with larger proteins, which perform better compared to smaller proteins. And I think that's, I, I don't know for sure, but I speculate that it's just purely because there are more epitopes in a larger protein with a bigger surface area. Sure. Um, so there may not be anything more to it than that. So I, I think it depends on the details of your protein. The other thing I would add is that um, there are very good immunization-based approaches for nanobody generation um, that you can do on, on a contract basis or collaborating with someone who has a llama farm. Um, for things like intracellular proteins or proteins that are not you know, highly homologous to llama, um, those approaches can work really well. Antitensin receptor is both biochemically unstable and highly homologous to llama receptor. And so it ends up being a really relatively poor ammunition because I think it just denatures as soon as it goes into the animal. Thanks. Ilya, this is, this is Paul. Can I ask um, a question quickly? Sure, of course. Um, so admittedly, I haven't kept up with the literature, but I remember several years ago, the angiotensin receptor, some people were postulating that uh, it could directly sense tension in the membrane and its activation was different when it did so. It act actually, I think if I remember correctly, activated a different G protein. Uh, where does that literature stand? And is it worthwhile looking to see if, if um, you know, using nanoparticles or something like that uh, and activating, you know, some panel with lysolipids or something like that, if it would, if, if this could be done? Yeah, I, I'm not so familiar with that for angiotensin receptor. There's work on the, I think on the appellant receptor, APJ, which is a, a relatively close homologue of the angiotensin receptor, um, claiming yeah, that, that there's a difference in, in biased signaling, essentially in relative signaling through the arrestin pathway versus G protein pathway, depending on mechanical force. Um, I have not seen much follow-up on that. Um, there's also work on another receptor on, on GPR68, suggesting a, a similar sort of story where um, mechanical flow seems to activate the receptor in sort of a different way. You know, one of the challenges I think is that in, in our typical signaling assays, we like to do dose response to the compound that we can dilute out. And I, I'd worry that, you know, any sort of mechanical stimulation is complicated by the fact that many different things are changing in the cell under those conditions. Um, so it, it's something that we just haven't explored in this case, but in, in principle, I suppose it's possible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I imagine it would be pretty tough. Yeah, thanks. All right, I think we need to go to the second part. Okay, so um, yeah, the second part is, is shorter, so I'll, I'll be efficient with everyone's time. Um, so just to, to set the stage, I want to mention two basic paradigms for antibody discovery. Um, the first is animal immunization methods. This is classically done through um, injecting mice and ultimately making hybridomas, but there are a lot of newer methods 
um, relying on single B cell sequencing and, um, and other methods. And uh, the other major paradigm is synthetic approaches using combinatorial biology. Um, so that's like the yeast display approach I showed a moment ago, um, also phage display, mRNA display, and so on. And each of these approaches has advantages and disadvantages. Um, immunization approaches are really great because they generate high affinity binders. They have access to somatic hypermutation and the full um, power of the immune system, and they're relatively accessible. You can do a lot of this um, on a contract basis with a CRO or service provider, but they're limited by things like tolerance of self. Um, so epitopes that are found in the animal being immunized often are not very, very good. Um, you can get immunodominance where you get a preferential immune response directed at a particular epitope. This is common for GPCRs to get a strong response to the intracellular face of the receptor, which makes it hard to make extracellular um, activators or inhibitors. And they're incompatible. This method is incompatible with biochemically unstable antigens because the antigen has to stay folded in the animal for some period of time if you want to find confirmation specific binders. Um, and many GPCRs unfortunately fall into this category. Um, synthetic approaches in contrast uh, have really the opportunity for very precise control over the selection process. You can run the selection in any buffer, any salt concentration pH you like um, within reason. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and scalable compared to animal immunization approaches, but they're limited by the fact that the diversity of the library is fixed at the outset. And oftentimes the clones that come out of these selections need further optimization after discovery. So you saw that with the angiotensin receptor where um, we developed a, a functionally very interesting clone, AT110, um, but the affinity wasn't high enough for crystallography to start, and so we had to do affinity maturation to improve it. So really, we want to achieve the best of both approaches, so having something that allows a high degree of molecular control, fast turnaround, but also has the power of a somatic hypermutation-like process. And so um, to do that, we turned to a technique called OrthoRep that was developed by Cheng Liu's group at UC Irvine. And um, I'll explain a little bit of the background of how this technique works and then how um, we were able to implement it with the yeast display system together with Chang's group. So um, basically the idea here is that certain yeast have uh, selfish genetic elements that replicate as linear plasmids in the cytoplasm. Um, they come as pairs of plasmids called P1 and P2. Um, P1 can be modified to introduce a gene of interest. And then P2 contains a bunch of uh, housekeeping machinery um, like an mRNA capping enzyme and so forth to um, process the RNAs that come off of this. Um, and the key point here is that this P1 plasmid is replicated by its own dedicated DNA polymerase, um, which can be modified to have a very high error rate. And so um, because these plasmids use their own dedicated uh, DNA polymerases, you can introduce a high error rate polymerase that selectively mutates the gene of interest while sparing the host genome. And as I said, this is work from Chang Liu's group in developing the system in the first place and, and moving it into Saccharomyces cerevisiae for enzyme evolution. Um, and so um, we teamed up with his group to develop a system to do this for antibody display. So the basic idea of the system is shown here. We have a yeast cell um, displaying your antibody of interest. And then um, we have this orthogonal DNA polymerase uh, encoded in a uh, nuclear plasmid, conventional plasmid. Um, and then this. Um, engineered DNA polymerase selectively mutates and replicates and mutates um, this P1 plasmid, which has um, the protein of interest, the antibody fragment encoded with an epitope tag, and then a cell wall anchoring sequence, um, as well as a selectable marker, TRIP1 in this case. So we can encode our antibody fragments here and use this error prone polymerase to diversify the antibody fragments with passaging. So essentially, as you grow the cells, the antibodies are continuously diversifying at a low rate. Um, really mimicking the process of somatic hypermutation um, in conventional immune antibody uh, maturation. And I should mention um, that this took quite a little, quite a lot of work to actually make this uh, useful in practice. The big barrier was that the display levels of the antibody um, in the original system were very low. And so we were able to use this system to um, diversify the, the system itself. So actually changing things like the promoter here to improve expression um, was really important. So the system then that uh, comes out of this is shown here. Basically, we, we have this yeast cell with these um, properties. We can take a library of uh, antibody fragments or a single antibody fragment. And as we passage the cells, they're continuously diversifying, incubate them with an antigen of interest, sort them by fax or magnetic cell sorting, and then passage. So it's the same basic paradigm I showed you before, but the key difference is that at each round of selection, diversity is being reintroduced. And so we can keep iteratively improving the affinity of any given clone.
So as a pilot, we started with AT110, the nanobody I showed you at the beginning. And um, if we look at the sequence of this nanobody from N to C in each round uh, and look at the frequency of mutation on the y-axis, we can see that as we evolve it, um, we observe mutations that first arise, like this I98V mutation, the same mutation we found by uh, conventional error-prone uh, mutagenesis. Um, this mutation first arises at low frequency, rapidly goes to fixation, and then that serves as the background for further uh, mutations, like this R66H, which then goes to fixation. And these mutations iteratively arise and, and fix, um, leading to uh, improved variants uh, over time. So we see yeah, iterative emergence and fixation of single mutations, um, which is in part reflective of the still relatively low mutation rate of this uh, error-prone polymerase. So as we go through the selection process, I'm just showing a, a proxy for affinity here, this log IC50 and the allosteric uh, shift assay. Um, AT110 is OK at about 50 nanomolar. It's improved by this I98V mutation. It's improved further with uh, R66H and finally with Y113H. And one interesting aspect of this is that the later mutations, R66H and Y113H, actually didn't do that much on their own. Um, they have relatively modest improvements in affinity um, in this assay. So to some degree, it does seem that having this I98V as a starting mutation might help um, these other mutations to arise later. So um, as a, a model system to look at this in more detail, um, we looked at SARS-CoV-2 targeting nanobodies. So we made um, eight different nanobodies using our conventional system targeting the SARS-CoV-2 RBD. Um, and then we performed this process to do iterative um, improvement of affinity. I'm just showing the facts sorting here for one of these clones where we start with 40 nanomolar of the target. Um, RBD is the receptor binding domain that's required for interacting with the host ACE2 protein. Um, and we can drop the concentration, and yet we still see a progressive increase in the level of binding. So um, these clones are continuously evolving to become more and more uh, effective binders. Um, if we look at the mutations that occur through this evolution process across all of these different clones, um, we see that they're generally uh, in the CDR loops or near the CDR loops. We found sort of a hotspot mutation here where uh, the same mutation occurs repeatedly, which probably suggests that something about the library design itself could be improved. And uh, as you'd expect, as these mutations um, improve the affinity, um, when we measure them in an SPR assay, we can see that the parent clones um, show relatively modest binding. We actually deliberately selected relatively low affinity clones to start this process. So this clone called RBD10 has about 400 nanomolar affinity. And after evolution, um, it ends up being sub-nanomolar QD. And this correlates with improved neutralization potency um, in a pseudovirus assay. So the parent clone is in dark purple and it improves through the selection round to become much more effective at neutralizing the pseudovirus. And so um, we did this across a, a number of different clones, eight in total, I'm showing data here from five of them that we characterized in more detail. And um, on the top of each of these little slices here is showing the affinity. So just biochemical binding affinity as it changes by round. And so we start here with about a one micromolar affinity and improve down to um, somewhere between 10 and 100 nanomolar. And then on the bottom of each uh, slice is a measurement of neutralization potency. And these, these axes are matched. Um, so the neutralization potency is generally um, better than the, the true biochemical binding affinity. Um, and we see that in some cases, these correlate uh, very strongly with each other. In other cases, we see like in clone 11, the neutralization potency really improves more quickly than uh, biochemical affinity. So since this literally just involves culturing the cells in parallel and then occasionally running a sort, um, we can evolve many clones simultaneously with relatively little investment of, of labor. Um, oftentimes the best clones at the end weren't the best clones at the beginning. And so if we could only do one or a few clones, um, we may not know which ones to start with. So doing this in parallel, I think is really powerful. And um, we found clones that were functionally very diverse. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. So the last question then before wrapping up is just to say that we'd obviously like to be able to start this with a naive library. Um, so a library that's not um, just a collection of clones that already have some binding activity, but really a, a completely synthetic um, library with no predefined binding activity to any target. Um, the challenge there is that this orthorep system can only accommodate relatively small libraries. And so we need to think about how to very efficiently sample the limited sequence space that we have available, about 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh clones. So with the conventional library where we randomly diversify CDR3s, you can sort of imagine a situation like this. 
where the space of possible sequences, we imagine it as this rectangle, is populated by random dots that we actually sample. So the total possible sequence space is enormous. It's many, many billions of fold larger than what we can actually sample, um, but we can test individual points randomly scattered throughout this. The downside of this is that some clones end up being relatively similar to each other just by chance. They're nearby in sequence space. And so on some in some sense, this is wasted diversity. We have a big empty space over here that we haven't sampled. So really what we'd like to do is to sample the space in a more uniform way so that each clone is equally dissimilar uh, from the others. And then with the ortho system, we are doing essentially a local sequence search around each of these points in sequence space to try to find any uh, local minima that might be present. So to achieve this, we collaborated with uh, Debbie Marks and her student, Jun Shin, um, to develop a, a machine learning method for training a, a computational model um, on, the, on a collection of um, llama-derived sequences so that we could then generate new sequences that had the same biochemical properties, so the same uh, CDR length, the same overall net charge, same distribution and overall hydrophobicity. Um, but we can generate many billions of these sequences computationally and then cluster them and then from each cluster, take a representative uh, example sequence and then use that as the basis for uh, synthesizing a library. And so you can see if we measure uh, sequence similarity for the natural repertory in blue compared to our design library in green, on average, uh, the pairwise distance between sequences is much larger. So the, the sequences are less similar um, from one another than they would be in the immune system. But despite that, they retain the same overall properties in terms of charge and uh, CDR3 length and so forth. And so um, we made a very, very small pilot library. This is a library of about 190,000 clones um, designed in this way. And um, we were able to find from that um, one binder for GFP as a model antigen, and then selected it through uh, six cycles of this evolution process. And um, we're able to show that it has a modest improvement in binding affinity. Um, since this is a model, we haven't really pushed it further. Um, but I think it says that this is feasible at a basic level. Um, and so now we're, we're preparing to go into much larger libraries um, instead of 190,000 clones, um, doing something on the order of uh, 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh library, and probably doing this with several different starting points to find out what the best, most evolvable pool of clones is. So um, we found binders to GFP and, and can improve affinity uh, at least modestly. So to wrap up then, um, I've shown that you can combine yeast display with this orthorep evolution system to uh, rapidly optimize many nanobodies in parallel. Um, a carefully designed naive library can yield evolvable binders. And I, I think in longer term, the hope is that this fully in vitro platform will recapitulate key aspects of the immune system um, while also having many of the advantages of a synthetic um, in vitro selection process. And with that, I just wanna thank the people involved in the work. Um, the first part of the talk really was led by Meredith Skiba, a postdoc in the lab in collaboration with uh, Laura Wingler and Dean Staus and Bob Lefkowitz's group. And then um, all of the work on the, the Orthorep evolution system was done in collaboration with Cheng Liu um, and Alon Wellner in his lab. And uh, in my group, it was led by Connor McMahon, who's a, a former postdoc. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andrew. That was very, very, very interesting. <laughs> so any questions on the second part? Yeah. I'm sure everybody now thinking, how to use it for their system <laughs> and, and how realistic. So, so do you think in terms of sort of application of this, do you think it will be like a sort of, it's, it's at the point where a lab without specialized background can sort of run this kind of screen or it will require some, you know, expertise in like is genetic. It, it's been varied. I mean, we've, we've distributed the original, um, the original library now to something like 400 or 500 different groups and um, some people have had really a lot of success with it and others have not. I would say in general, the groups that have been most successful are protein biochemists um, or people who have experience with yeast display. Anyone who has done yeast display successfully before seems to have no trouble with it. It's, you know, you can pretty much plug and play. The biggest technical barrier um, seems to be uh, getting access to a fax facility that will allow you to sort yeast. It's kind of a stupid thing, but a lot of facilities are just absolutely adamantly opposed to this. Um, we use a sorter, our sorter is shared with a group that does like mammalian primary cell culture, and that's fine. We've never had any issues with contamination. Um, we flush the lines with bleach after every sort, and that decontaminates it. But for, for many people who've struggled with it, I think that's been one of the major challenges. Um, it's also really important to have good quality antigen. If you don't have biochemically pure 
monodispersed, good quality protein, then your selection is sort of doomed from the outset. I see. Makes sense. Oh, well, that's, yeah, I think that's a fantastic tool that people can, can figure out how to do it easily. I would add too that we, we have protocols on my lab website. So if you want, if you're interested in it, you can look and see what's involved. Um, they're overly detailed, I think, by design. Um, we also have a frequently asked questions thing. So hopefully it helps people get a sense of how tractable it is. Anybody? Everybody's scratching their hand and trying to figure out how to get the puck sorted. <laughs> All right, if there are no any more questions, okay, let's thank Andrew for, it was very interesting talk in terms of technology development and we'll have to talk to him more about Sigma after once his paper's out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thank okay. you, Andrew.